facts and some notes on on how it's used. Okay. Um, okay. So I appreciate that uh, that feedback, and I'll get get out the um, the updated uh, updated due date for the uh, problem set. I'll be extended by a couple of days. So you can work on it over the weekend following that that intro to Python. Okay. Okay. Um, so today I wanted to uh, wrap up some of the um, some of the topics we uh, talked about last time. Um, go over again. I, I confirmed that, and and this was my bad. Um, I was using last time some slides that I'd actually put in a deprecated folder, um, and I had revised those slides. Um, for class last time, but I was using the old version, and that caused some confusion. I apologize about that. Um, I did want to go over just a couple of things. Uh, one were some slides on currying that I ended up doing on the board, um, and which uh, you know I wanted to be sure you you had available to you. I've posted these slides uh, since um, on currying. So, does anyone remember when we talked about? currying a function. So we, we had a function and it only makes sense to talk about it in the context of a function of a couple of arguments. Most classic case being it's, it has two arguments. When we curry that function, what are we doing? Anyone remember? So through currying, by currying, what do we get out? We're essentially converting into a series of functions that have less uh, parameters. Good. So this is an example of staged computation. Staged not in the sense that it's fake, um, but in the sense that it's divided up into stages or phases, right? Stage computation. So um, here, we're taking this original function and we're turning it into one function that accepts an argument A the first argument of it, and that returns a function that then takes b and does all the work that f of a and b would do. Well, actually, not necessarily all. Some of the work might be done when you give it a, in fact, but it completes it when you give it b. Okay. Um, so we divide this up into something along these lines, f of a, which then includes something which might do some work, but then it takes lambda of b, so it returns a function taking a, a b, and then does all, finishes the work that f of a and b would, would perform. So it's a way of dividing up the um, taking of arguments and the work that has to be done by this original binary function or, or uh, uh, yes, binary function f, which takes a and b, and it takes it in stages. First, takes the first argument, does some work, returns a function that takes the second argument, does some work, and finishes the job. And this actually featured a little bit in the take-home exercise that I gave you. How did it feature? Can anyone um, talk about that? How did that feature? So this is my, this is my solution to the take-home exercise here. By the way, I appreciate whoever got the lights. This is better. Um, so uh, I asked you in the context of this uh, take-home exercise to define a derivative function, right? And this derivative function um, was itself staged in the sense that it took two arguments first, a function of which to take the derivative, some function that you're going to take the derivative of, and an epsilon term or a dx term, which is a small, a small little um, unit of, of, of distance over which you'll take the derivative. And, and doing that, it returns a function that takes an x. What is this x here? I should have called it x0 to be, to be, to be more clear here. This x0 to be more consistent with my notation. My notation. What is this x0? It's the actual point at which you're evaluating the derivative. Yeah. So when we when we have a um, function here, um, you know, we, we may have a, a function of some arbitrary point, and we're taking the derivative at a certain point. So maybe it's at 
you know, this point here. Maybe this is our x0. And we're taking the derivative, so we're assessing the slope of this, this sort of curve here, right at that point. What's the slope there? Versus, say, what's the slope, you know, at, at, at this point here? Um, or what's the slope uh, at this point, which might be totally flat? Or what's the slope at this point, which might be like that? So we can take the slope of a function. This is, might be our function uh, here. Fn unary, a unary, some unary function. It's unary because there's a single argument x, and um, and we can assess the slope of it at different points. In other words, take the derivative of it at different points. So that's what this x zero is. Okay. Um, so this is a staged function in the sense that we give it some arguments. It gives us back a function which is specialized to that first set of arguments. Um, and knows how to use them when given one more argument, x0. Hmm? So this is kind of a derivative operator. We give it a function, and we give it a little bit of information, and it gives us back a function that, um, that's the derivative of the, the first function we gave. Does that make sense as an overall structure? OK, so now let's talk about how it's achieved. So this is the derivative function. And basically, I uh, take those first two arguments, return a, a function, probably to make this clearer, I, it would have been even better to, to return this like, like this with, with some, um, uh, some parentheses around it. So given these first two arguments, now I return this function. And this function remembers those first two arguments. That's part of having a a what? What did I use as the sort of the word for a, a function that remembers remembers information, remembers its environment, remembers the, the binding of, the meaning of um, fn unary and epsilon, knows their values. What do I call that thing? It's called a, begins with C, closure, closure it's a closure. It's so important a term that this whole programming language named after, closure with a J. Okay, um, great. Okay, so it returns a closure. And this closure remembers Fn unary, remembers epsilon, and it does the right thing with them. Um, to wit, it computes this little computation, which is basically figuring out, you know, over this little space, you know, if I move over, if I move over this far here, this little epsilon space, this is x0 plus epsilon, how far up does it go um, when I do that compared to the value at x0? And it takes you know, this minus this divided by this, uh, this distance here, which is just epsilon. So it takes this kind of distance here, how far up it goes, the rise over the run, the epsilon. And that's what figures out the slope, OK? That, that's the meaning of this mathematical expression. Okay. So, so mathematically, that's what it is. Computationally, it's returning a closure. Now, that's a really useful thing I argued last time, but I didn't have a great example to sort of tell you. And so I came up with this partly to sort of provide, you know, some motivation for why you do this. Okay, so what that allows us to do is to then have, you can give me a function, and in this case, I specify with lambdas, but it could be any function you give me. It could be passed in from another module of the program. Um, this could be in a library and someone passes in a function when calling this library. And using that, we could take the derivative of a function with respect to some, some epsilon and get out a function. And then we could do things that are useful, like map that function over some test points. Um, and, uh, and I did that here. So these were our test points here. and. I mapped each of these functions over those test points. So what is what is except for the first, which is which is zero, d1. Um, so I mapped these over the test points. What's the use of doing this? When I map this this return function over these test points, what am I doing? And in, in, in sort of intuitive terms, what's the meaning of this? That I'm mapping this thing over the test points. You're giving um, dx 
the, all the test points in as X? That's right. That's right. Your name? Uh, Peter. 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 Um, that's right. So I'm basically, so DX is the derivative of, well, it's, a, it's the um, identity function, the derivative of, of, of F of X equals X, right? And I'm evaluating that derivative at each of the test points. That's, these test points are a set of points, you know, it starts at minus one, that's minus four times 0.25, and and then it's minus, it's minus one, it's minus 0.75, it's minus 0.5, it's minus 0.25, it's zero, successfully spaced at 0.25, okay? And for each of those test points, I'm evaluating that derivative of this original function. And I get back some, some values I can look at. Okay, um, and same thing with 2x, and same thing with x squared. So by naming these things, giving them a name, being able to use them, I can then, I can then use them in my computation repeatedly um, at many places in my computation. I don't have to worry that I have to keep on passing around this lambda or this epsilon here. It just, it remembers all those things, and I can just use these as I see fit, right? Another thing I might do in another program might be to, to use, you know, create this function, this closure, and use it as an event handler. Or I might, you know, use it and, um, and pass it in as a callback or something like that. The point is, having created this function, um, I can use it on a repeated basis many times without having to repass the information that it's remembered, the f at unary and epsilon. It just remembers it. So here I map it, right? I map it at each of these points. And this math works because all this function, say dx, needs to do its job is one thing. What does it need? dx, I would argue, is a unary function itself. What does it need in life to do its job? What's the one thing dx needs to do its job? That is, hey. Having, having been created, having been created by this derivative operator, what, what does dx expect as an argument? This is not a, not a trick question. It's one x value. Yeah, it just it requires one x value. X takes that value and it returns the derivative at that point. Um, that's why math works. This derivative operator, it's taking these two arguments but it's returning a function that respects, just, just asks for one thing in life, and it'll do its job. Tell me where to perform the derivative, I'll give it to you. And it knows what function with respect to take it, right? F n unary. So, so here I can just map the derivative of this function over these test points. I can map the derivative of this other function over those test points, or of x squared. I created some other test points for sine, and I can map, and, and I took the, the derivative of, of the sine, the sine function, and I can map them over the test points. So having built these kind of functions, that these closures that remember things, you can then use them on an ongoing basis without having to worry about repassing fn unary and epsilon. Those are remembered, one and done. It's been done once, and all you all it needs is the remaining arguments. Now, in functional programming style. Regardless of whether you're using Pascal or you know uh, a Lisp dialect scheme or 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 a racket or what have you, um, uh, you know those languages are all great, and I would encourage people who are interested in them. Clojure is another example one. But regardless of whether you're using those languages or whether you're using JavaScript or whether you're using Python or whether you're using Scala or whether you're using Java eight, it's really useful to know about this basic technique of of currying or staged computation. You have a function that in a pr traditional C-like programming language or traditional Java, it would need every time to have all the arguments specified, f n unary, epsilon, and x zero. It would need all of them. But in these, in these, uh, using these functional components, what we can do is we can divide it up into stages where you know, we give it some of the information up first, up front, it gives us back a function, a specialized function, that does its job. It just does its job from then on. And it's a really useful technique for cleaning up code. By contrast, if you had to specify every time to a derivative, 
you have to remember what function am I doing it with respect to, what's the epsilon and what's the x. It becomes a lot more crufty, a lot more repeated sort of use of certain functions. The code becomes much larger than it has to be. By staging the computation, by dividing it into stages, we can get a clean separation of one set of information from the other, which keeps our code our code mechanisms to a minimum and really can allow us to reuse mechanisms like MAP that are, that are very general and powerful rather than having to, you know, ourselves manually call, call um, you know, the, the uh, derivative operator with all three arguments. So here, by, by dividing up the derivative operator into two stages, we can clean up our code. Any questions on that? Questions on that? Do you see how these staged computations could be useful in general? Not, I mean, this is one case, but in general, if we could create event handlers, if we can create callbacks, if we can um, create, create functions that are then used elsewhere in our program, it means we don't have to carry around and remember. We don't have to remember to pass them a lot of things throughout the code. We just pass them what they need you know, up front at, at that time, and then they remember it for us instead of us having to remember it. So it takes load off of us as developers. Okay, so that was one thing that I wanted to illustrate with this. And it's a good technique. And it's a technique available to you now in Java with Java 8. Okay? Now, there's some other features of this code that I wanted to emphasize. And I'll, I may come back to some of them Thursday when I give this introduction to Python I have to come up with. But one of them was this issue of list comprehensions. So that's what this thing is in brackets here. It's a, it's a, it's a comprehension. I'm creating here a, a list which is defined with this funny little expression here. And similarly, there's another one down here. What's going on with this expression? Can anyone read for me what does this expression say? And in sort of intuitive terms. In rough terms, what does that expression say? You can almost read it out, so it's not a deep, it's not a deep thing I'm asking, but, but what does this say to do? What's the meaning of this thing in, in square brackets? In that range, do that um, i times 0.25 to each thing in good. that range. Good, good, good. Yeah, it's creating a list sort of an array type object, uh, for each i within this range from minus four, what's, what's this range minus four to five, what's the biggest value it's gonna give back? Four. Four, not five, but four. It's gonna start with minus four and go up to four, right? Your name again? Eric. Eric, yes. Um, thanks. The, these things, like each time they, they uh, you know, keep on um, pushing through my cranium, eventually get through. The last day of class, I'll learn your name. Um, um, so, uh, thank you. Um, so for each i in this range, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, we're going to create i times 0.25. Um, and it's going through each successive one. And that will create a list. It's a sweet syntax, don't you agree? To be able to do that? It's, it's quite nice to be able to express it in that way. Now, what is this a little bit, the Queen's English fails me. This is a little bit like some other thing we've been doing. In fact, within this very program, it's a little bit like what we can do with another construct. Another, another thing I've been showing you in functional style. What is it? This is a little bit like what you'd get out of, how, could, how else could I write this? If I didn't have list comprehensive, what could I write? I could write a, begins with an M, map. a map. I could write a map. Um, I would be mapping over what, over what collection would I be mapping over? Mapping over the range. Over the range. And what will be the function that I map over the range? What would be the function? For each element of the range, what would I return? Multiply by 0.25. Lambda of i colon i times 0.25. So I could do it with math, right? I could. What are the trade-offs there? Anyone want to say? 
So list comprehensions are great things. Um, what are the trade-offs? Anyone, anyone see any trade-offs between them? Well, Matt would already need the list created. Yeah, so you need to, well, yeah, I mean, you could, you could take minus 4.5, you could, you could put that expression in here, right? In other words, as the second argument for Matt, you could just give it m minus, instead of giving it a name, test points, you could give it minus 4 to, to 5, but it would, it would need to, it would need to apply that, or you need to apply that right there so it gets that. So, um, whereas here it's right, you know, part of the, part of the clear expression. So, uh, not too different there. Um, but, uh, but what else is going on here? Which do you find clearer to read? That's a lot more clear. The list comprehension? Yeah, so many people feel that list comprehensions are a little bit easier to understand um, than maps. There's a little bit less cruft, a little bit less um, extra verbiage in the sense that with map you need a lambda of i colon i times two. So a little bit more, um, more, more verbiose, um, more, more sort of words needed to accomplish the same thing. Let's, let's, let's just put it down to be very, very concrete of how I could accomplish it. Um, you know, test points v, <laughs> v2, right? Test points with map, how's that? Um, so uh, tell me what to write. Tell me what to write. What would I write here? Uh, map. Map. And a lambda x. Okay, I can do x. I'm, I'm just gonna say i, okay? Just, just because i's often, um, you know, probably, uh, 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 well, okay, yes, I like X better, actually. It has a nicer, sort of, it's more appropriate in this case. I kind of agree. Um, well, God. okay, I'm going to call it I for <laughs> reasons I'll talk about. Okay, lambda of I, what do I put? I times 0. .5. I times, great, great. Peggy, is it? Yeah. You're great. Okay, um, and then what do I put here? And then you'll do the range. The range, right? Minus four to five. Okay. Um, well, it's really making suggestions. Um, okay, that's that's great. Um, so that will work. That will work. Um, there's the lambda, which is a little bit distracting. Um, someone would need to know. Maybe Kyle partly had this in mind. Someone would need to um, know that you know range. This thing here is the thing over which to map this, and you have to kind of keep that in mind. Where it's, it's pretty clear with the list comprehension, you know what's what what's the 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 collection, and then what's the the the, the way to generate the value. Um, okay. Um, uh, any other uh, comments on on sort of trade-offs between these? Turns out there is a bit of a difference, and. And it's not super obvious, so you know I think it's it's perfectly uh, perfectly. Whoa, 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 okay, map versus list comprehensions. Okay, um, so I'm going to put in here. I think list comprehensions a little bit easier to read. List comprehensions somewhat uh, easier to read and terser, right? Um, I think that's a, those are fair fair comments, and others have made them uh, as well. Um, one thing is uh, lambdas actually have clearer scope. So let, let me let's go back to my to this code here, and I will just note that if I do something like this, let's suppose I had this test points, and I said for for i uh, in um, range zero to hundred, so zero to to nine nine nine. Okay, I do these test points. It turns out this range i here will clobber this one. In other words, after performing this, this I will be changed. Um, so they interfere with each other. This I and this I out here, um, they kind of share the same underlying representation. Is that true for this? Could I, could I, if I had um, something like this, um, and, uh, and I had something like this, Boom, boom. Um, would this eye interfere with this one? No. It turns out it's just like calling a function whose 
whose parameter is i. It doesn't it doesn't interfere with this outer one. Though. A whole stack record, or stack an activation frame, a whole stack um, stack uh, uh, activation record or stack frame is created as a result for every call to this. So those eyes don't actually interfere with each other. The other one does. A second thing is this map is actually uh, has a characteristic that one hopes is absent from everyone in this fine classroom. Which is, is that it's lazy. Okay? Um, what do I mean by it's lazy? It doesn't do work that it doesn't have to. It doesn't do work that it doesn't have to. And so it only will do the work that's required of it in terms of the values you actually use. So you could give it a god-awful big range. And it will give you back a value that you could then you know, refer to the first item and the second item, third item. If you only refer to the first 10 items, it actually won't do the computation for the rest. Now, some of you were in my 214 class a couple of years back. And I introduced for you then in, in Linux, Linux piping. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so here, you know, we might um, we might uh, take a um, uh, take a file, for example, and uh, we might um, we might pass it through successive filters of, of various sorts. So we might pass it through an awk, for example, um, where we actually so we might do something like ls minus lt for some pattern. Um, uh, you know, foo, um, foo star, and that gives us a, a listing from ls, and then we pass it through awk, and we split it up. We split it up according to some particular separator that's significant in terms of the names, um, and we have a little thing, you know, print, print number two, so print the the second sort of item in it when divided up this way, and then we might put that into um, some other some other operator with said and, and and so on. And one of the advantages I argued about doing this was that it's done incrementally, meaning the first item here is processed by this and processed by this in turn. The second item, it's not waiting to the end of this list. It's actually doing each successive one passing through the pipeline. So you can actually stop it at an arbitrary point. You, you don't have to wait for the first one to complete before the second one starts giving values to the third one and before you start seeing things out of the whole, the whole shebang. And it's like that with math, ladies and gentlemen, in the sense that um, you, get, you get as many arguments out as you want to process, but it doesn't actually go and, in fact, somewhat of a difference here is it doesn't go and, and uh, do the rest until you need them. And so as a result, you can stop at a time of your choosing. You don't need to, to have it produce all of the arguments. So ladies and gentlemen, um, MAP, having, having this lazy feature, allows us to, to sort of um, defer work uh, if desired and use as much as we want and defer the rest to later without overhead, which is pretty sweet, actually. It doesn't have to do all the work up front. And in contrast, list comprehensions don't do that. Um, as, as someone said online, with list comprehensions, if you give it a god-awful thing, you will be sad um, because it'll take a long time to do it. Um, it'll, it'll stop at that point doing the computation for a very long time, okay? Um, so laziness. Um, another thing is we can, we can actually curry curry map so we can we can actually create a function that given the collection given a collection it will apply a known function to that collection and in a way we can't curry this kind of minor minor thing but it's it's a general feature of doing it in a functional way uh, list comprehensions if you're going to write python list comprehensions are great things to use and they're really recommended um, 
I'll certainly use them interchangeably. Sometimes I use map for some reason, or I'll use list comprehensions. But they're very, very nice, very nice uh, features of the language, and we'll talk about them a little bit more on um, on Thursday. Okay, list comprehensions are, are one feature of this code. Um, anyone want to ask any questions about this code before we get on to um, some some new material? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so that was take home exercise as normal. I'll I'll post it. Okay. Um, Possibly this could help you in, in learning some about uh, about Python. Oh, what did I miss here? Python, what did I miss? Colin, Colin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um, happy, happy. This this one is bad. This is this is badness, badness. Um, we don't want them to interfere with each other. Um, okay, great. So. Um, I think that's that's uh, I'll leave that behind now and now I want to go on to a different topic ladies and gentlemen I want to go on to this issue of subtyping okay so this is what we want to talk about um, okay so we're, we're transitioning right now from um, discussion of, of functional abstraction discuss uh, to discussion of type-based abstraction, and particularly classes, okay? Um, and we're going to be talking about the use of mechanisms, uh, interfaces, and in classes in, in object-oriented languages, such as Java. Um, and we'll also talk about traits a little bit as they are captured in Scala um, and, and their relationship with mixins, okay? Um, and within these languages, whether it's C-sharp or or Java, or C++, or Scala, others will often see two ways of capturing type-based interfaces. When we have a type, um, whether it's a class or an interface, we, we express it in those two mechanisms. Um, we can have an interface and provide an implementation of the interface. The interface provides a sort of contract. Or we can have a class, and the class also provides a contract, where classes, we can have inheritance going on, which is inheritance of implementation. Um, with an interface, we basically state what the contract is, and then a given class can implement that interface. With classes, um, when we subclass, it turns out we're not only getting the contract along with it, we are getting the implementation, okay? Um, and there's things abstract classes to provide a partial specification of implementation, but um, but leave the rest uh, to be to be specified. Okay, um, so we're going to have some some trade-offs between these that we're going to be exploring in terms of uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, of each. But just to sort of motivate this, because this is going to take us through a couple lectures of this class. Um, here we're going to have. Uh, type hierarchies, um, which are denoted here um, in with two types of um, of um, uh, indications. So one, we're going to have these ones that are in these sort of ovals, which are interfaces. These are interfaces in Java. This is from the Java um, Java class uh, Java uh, libraries. Right? So we have iterable, collection, set, sorted, set, queue, list. These are interfaces. There's no implementation directly provided to them. By contrast, um, these things that are shown without the, uh, the uh, ovals around them are in fact classes. Classes that, as we say, implement this interface. They provide a, a working sort of uh, example of this interface, a working implementation of it that can be used. Okay, so we have an array list, which is a type of list, which is itself a type of collection, itself is a type of iterable. It can be used as an iterable. Okay, enum set, hash set, etc. Okay, great. Um, okay, so, um, you know, these are very common within the context of, um, of, of uh, Java libraries and within Java programming, but more broadly in object-oriented languages. 
we would see the same thing and you know if we went over to the .NET world and um, with C Sharp and other .NET languages we would see very similar things in C++ etc. So what are some benefits of these type hierarchies? Um, why would you why would you create this sort of a construct? Anyone tell me? Why create that? Why define a type hierarchy? Why go through all this work of specifying these relationships? Can anyone give me a couple reasons? So that you don't have to repeat the same code over and over again? Good. Reuse of code. So, so how could code be reused here? Can you give me an example like, uh, say, linked hash map and hash map? How could there be an opportunity for, for code reuse? The fact that linked hash map is a subclass of hash map, um, what, why does that help with code reuse? Just, just to make it very concrete. Link, linked hash map has all of the features of hash map, so you don't have to implement, the get, implement them again. You can just take right. them and then add to them. Right, and I think that's what exactly what Kyle had in mind. Um, so by virtue of this being a subclass, by virtue of linked hash map being a subclass of hash map, um, it's inherited, as we say, the implementation of hash map. So it's able to reuse all these mechanisms. Let's, let's think in very concrete terms. What that means is like a variable that's in a hash map implementation, you know, an instant, a field, right? Uh, an instance variable uh, within classes. Um, I'm not sure what terminology is used in 270. Do you talk about fields of a class or instance variables of a class? Um, okay. Um, so linked hash map gets all of those, right? But also the methods which are declared in hash map, linked hash map automatically gets all those methods except those which it does what with? It overrides, overrides them, right? Okay. So, so linked hash map is is getting all these mechanisms to implement that map from hash map, right? It's, it's able to reuse them instead of having to write them again. That's a huge and perhaps historically the biggest motivation for using um, subclassing. It's been to, to reuse these goodies, you know, that, that were declared in, in the superclass. Um, and that has some real advantages quality-wise. The fact that you don't have to rewrite them means that you don't have to re-mistake. You know, we don't have to reinvent the square wheel. We don't have to write bugs into it, right? We can reuse this code that was that was test that's been tested already. Reuse this code that's been well thought through in the superclass. We could reuse it in the subclass and get higher bug quality. And there was a thought, ladies and gentlemen. There was a thought early in the use of object-oriented programming. If you look back to the 80s and early 90s, there were a lot of heady predictions that object-oriented programming is going to revolutionize code quality because of this feature. This feature that was mentioned by, by uh, Kyle here and by Royce, that you get reuse of code and therefore reuse of high-quality code instead of writing new code, which is broken. Hmm? Do you think that's occurred? A revolution. No, no. It turns out it's been a lot harder than people think. And it turns out that subclassing itself has, and in fact, subtyping in general, has some really um, tight, th th there's, there's strict um, discipline that's needed to use it well. And that's what we're going to be talking about next. Um, and. Folks who first, when they first introduced it, they didn't realize how do you, what, what conventions, what uh, restrictions do you have to place in your code so that you can use these mechanisms of subclassing and subtyping safely um, without breaking your code. Um, so this whole idea of a revolution in software quality largely fizzled. Not to say object-oriented programming is great, it has great features to it, but this idea that it would revolutionize software quality got ran into real problems because people were abusing the meaning, the proper meaning of subtyping and proper meaning of subclass. So that's what we're going to be going to next. But but just to remind us, um, 
reuse of code is one of the big motivations for this. Another thing is extensibility, this idea of the, the uh, open-closed principle. The idea is here, for example, that, that look, in implementing HashMap, it implements a lot of the mechanisms. Linked HashMap only needs to sort of tweak around the edges of it, implement some additional things, and, and we, don't have to, we don't have to go back and re-examine how HashMap works. Once it's defined, we can just extend it without having to, to go back and think about all the implementation details of HashMap and debug it, et cetera. We, we, we just uh, extend it in a very uh, simple way, okay? It's open to, to extension, but it's closed to modification. Um, hash map doesn't have to be re-examined when we, when we uh, subclass it. And then finally, a benefit of what I call polymorphism. Can anyone tell me what's polymorphism? What is polymorphic? What does it mean for something to, to exploit polymorphism? cast to sub or super class? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's, uh, Kyle's again hit it on the head, so let's, let's go back and, and check this out. So, uh, well, well, since we've dwelled so much on that previous slide, we'll, we'll consider it here. So can you give me an example how you could use polymorphism to reduce the amount of, uh, well, how could you reduce polymorphism with this? So, Suppose I, I have something which takes in a, um, a file reader here, a, a, a reader. Um, how, could I, how could I use polymorphism to achieve some extra flexibility? So it expects a reader. What does that allow me to do? Maybe we'll, we'll make it even more concrete. Uh, I have something which expects a hash map. What, it, what can I do? Polymorphism gives me more flexibility. So I have a function. I'm writing a function, and its name, of course, is f. Okay, maybe you missed foo. You want its name to be foo? Okay, okay, fine. It'll be a function foo. And it takes, it takes a hash map. A hash map of, what are these, what are these things here? These greater than less. Yeah, yeah. So there's a key of values in this case. They're in general they're type parameters. Uh, in C they'd be called templates. In Java they're called Generic. generics. Yeah. So maybe this uh, the the key is a string, and maybe the value is a uh, a, a double with a capital D as an object. Okay. Great. So foo takes this in, and this is the most un unfortunate juxtaposition. Okay, and and so this takes an argument A, forgive my, um, uh, I'll call it HM, hash map. Okay, fine. Um, so this takes that. By virtue of polymorphism, what could I do instead? I could pass it a what? Uh, can I pass it a hash map? Yeah, you can pass it a hash map. What else could I pass it? A linked hash map. So the fact that Linked hash map is a subclass of hash map here. Allows me to pass it in as an argument to hash map. Okay, great. So polymorphism means for things that operate on or process, handle um, supertypes, they can now handle subtypes. They can handle these, these subclasses amongst them. But it's not restricted to classes. Right? So if I expect a collection, I can pass a queue in, anything that implements a queue, right? Um, if I pass, if I expect a collection, I can be given a list. Um, if I expect a list, I can be given a linked list. List is here not a class, it's, a, it's an interface. But all of them are, are types. They specify, they delineate sort of a set of possible values. Um, and it turns out that one of the best most fruitful ways to look at this is establishing contracts. So these interfaces and these classes are associated with contracts, things that make promises of what they do, and then they can have many implementations, including implementations in some subclasses, for example. Okay, so polymorphism 
provides another big advantage for having these hierarchies. We don't have to rewrite foo and call it, you know, have a foo2, which explicitly takes a linked hash map um, and has the same basic mechanism uh, as, as, this, as foo. We don't have to rewrite this specifically because um, you know, each has to be defined for, for different arguments. Uh, this would be a linked hash map. We don't have to do this because of polymorphism. We can reuse just this code. This might not have been the foremost thing Kyle had on his mind, but this is another example of code reuse, right? Because of polymorphism, we can pass in something of many different types into a, uh, a method or function that operates on it. I think a good example is yeah. um, the ability the ability to make a function that takes, for example, you could um, have it take a collection. If it took a collection, mm -hmm. then you could have give it an enum set, a priority queue, an array yeah. list, basically anything. But if you're like, no, I just want it to be like a list, then you just make it a list, and then you can just give it an array list or a linked list, but not like a hash set or something. Exactly. So we can we can delete sort of what types of things are legal to give it. We don't have to just say, well, you could take an object, right? No, we could, we could say like, in some case, I need a list uh, versus I need any collection. Those would be in two different cases. But in both cases, you've got a tremendous amount of flexibility because all sorts of people could define subclasses of these and in fact, subtypes of them in their programs and they could reuse your code. A very important thing about this, folks, this foo might have been written Are you folks older or younger than Java? Um, Java first came out, what, I remember it was 90, 94, 95 or Ooh, so? I'm older. Okay, okay. <laughs> My hat is off to you, join the club. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, um, I won't want to. Um, but uh, um, when Java came out, um, it was a much simpler language at that time. But um, it did have this feature of, of, of subtyping and subclassing. And it was a very clean way of being able to characterize uh, type hierarchies that, that um, we, can, we could use it in this way. It didn't yet have generics. Um, but um, through, through this, we could actually take code that was written back, back in the day, say with respect to, um, to, to uh, this hash map, and Five years from now, ten years from now, you could you could define a new type of sub subtype or subclass of hash map. You could define a new subclass, and this code that was written long before would still work because it it implements the hash map contract, the hash map interface. It 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 adheres to this, and therefore you could reuse this code. So code that was written long before your code can still use your objects when passed into it. Does that make sense? Um, that's very important because you know when we provide code um, that performs a service, we don't have to want to have to go rewrite that code totally every time someone um, new depends on it. Uh, we'd like to have libraries that can be reused years later by by people with entirely new types of objects that weren't even conceived of when we wrote the libraries. Okay, so type hierarchies like this have a bunch of advantages and. Um, Polymorphism is one of the key ones that we'll be, we'll be talking about. And those who have seen 371 will find some, some overlap because I, this material used to be in 470 and I had to move it to 371 to make sure students got exposed to some of it. And now I have it back in, in 470, particularly because most students here haven't taken 371 yet. Um, so we're gonna be talking about polymorphism. And polymorphism is basically about this decoupling of on the one time, on the one hand, the apparent type from the actual type. How do I use these terms? Th were these used in 270 when you talked about polymorphism? Class hierarchies, apparent type and actual type? Okay, so, so we might have foo here. I'm gonna erase this, this lower one, foo, foo, foo two, okay, foo n two. I don't know where the n came from. Okay. Um, 
So I might have some code within foo um, that manipulates hash map. And it might call, you know, insert, insert on it with, uh, with some key bar and with some value, um, you know, 3.14159, 15926, okay, so on. Um, okay, so I'm inserting into it. So here, this code is using something whose apparent type is hash map. But I would argue, and I stand before you submitting the thesis, that the actual type of HM might not be hash map. What could the actual type be? So the apparent type is hash map. After all, it says hash map. What could the actual type be? Um, link hash map? Yeah. yeah, linked hash map. It could be any subtype of it, right? Anything beneath it in this hierarchy, right? Um, anything beneath hash map here, down here, could be passed in as if it's a hash map, right? So hash map is the, the apparent type here. It's what I think I'm dealing with, hash map. But what's actually passed in could, might not be a tr uh, uh, exactly a hash map. It might be a linked hash map. It might be a Roycean hash map, right? Um, of the finest sort um, that's been passed in. Um, and and that, that alternative, um, the thing that it truly is, we call that the, the actual type, okay? So with polymorphism, you can separate the two. You can write code as if it's for the apparent type, hash map but actually we pass lots of different possible types. Um, okay, so we're programming, as we say, against the apparent type. We're saying, insert this as if it's a hash, a hash map, but the actual dispatching is against the actual type. What do I mean by that? The dispatching is against the actual type. So I call insert, say, uh, insert. Suppose I had a linked hash map that actually overrode insert. Actually, by override, I mean it provides its own implementation of insert. Whose insert would be called here? If I pass this a link hash map, here I am. I have a, some other code here, and it's in bar. Well, I already used bar in there, so I'll call it baz. Okay, here's some baz code, okay? Um, and somewhere in here is a link hash map um, that is nude up. Um, uh, linked hash map, okay, uh, hash map, and we, uh, it's, it's a linked hash map, and we we create it with new, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. And then we're going to call foo, pass it a linked hash map. And suppose linked hash map actually defines its own insert. It overrides the insert of hash map. Whose insert is called here? So the sanity check. Whose insert is called here? Linked. If, if linked hash maps. So that's why we say the dispatching is against the actual type. If I pass this a Roycean hash map in all its glory, um, and we call insert on that, if Royce is in fact overridden insert as part of his, um, his code base, then his insert will be called here. Even though the apparent type is a hash map, it's going to call the the actual the insert of the actual type. Does that make sense? Now, Kyle, for example, might provide his own subclass of hash map, which doesn't override insert. He doesn't need it, maybe, for, for his implementation. In which case, when we call insert here, it it would say, well, for the Kyle's Kyle's hash map, the, the Julian hash map, um, you know, uh, its insert is just the same as the, the, the insert of hash map itself. And so it would actually call just the one in, in hash map. But if, if the actual type overrides it, that's what will be called there. So the dispatching is based on the actual type. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to get us on the same page for coming discussions. That's, that's how Java works. If, if you're uncertain about that, um, come to my office during office hours. Uh, we can work through some examples. Um, if, if, if you want to, um, uh, you know, you, you'll want definitely to understand this, to grok this, 
uh, to before you graduate because this is a very important part of object-oriented programming. The the um, uh, polymorphism allows us to deal with this apparent type and we'll manipulate it as if it's a hash map, but when it comes to calling the function, it's actually using the, the function of whatever is truly passed into it. Okay, and it's very important to understand that to know how to use uh, object-oriented programming. And I'm happy to walk people through examples where you can see, see this in very concrete terms. Um, okay, are people comfortable with this though? Okay, because it's going to be kind of an assumed thing for coming lectures, and it's very important for understanding certain examples. Okay, we okay with that? Okay, um, great. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, um, the fact that we can use polymorphism allows us to achieve something Kyle emphasized before, which is, is reuse, right? So just to be clear, foo can be reused with linked hash maps, hash maps, Roycean hash maps, Julian hash maps, and finally, even Osgoodian hash maps, uh, which are as good as they get. Um, okay, <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, so um, the question here is, okay, so what is subtyping required to achieve this sort of polymorphism to be safe, okay? Um, so, so, you know, I can go and I can say, okay, the Osgoodian hash map is a subclass of hash map. And uh, in the Osgoodian hash map, I'm going to override insert, and I'm going to override delete, and I'm going to override add, and I'm going to override, you know, um, count elements or whatever. I could define all sorts of things. What does it need to be to work in code? Um, for for, for, for the Osgoodian hash map to be a genuine subtype of, of hash map passed around on it, um, what, is it what does it need for it to, to be safe? Well, I mean, the compiler is going to tell you a certain set of things that it needs. You need, you need the Osgoodian hash map to extend hash map, right? To be passed around as one of these guys, as a hash map, it has to extend hash map. Does it not? It has to extend hash map. Compilers can be mighty unhappy if, if it doesn't, right? Um, it's going to say, oh, you can't give me an, one of these Osgood things. Um, you know, I expected a hash map, and you gave me an Osgood hash map. Um, uh, well, it doesn't cut it. But if Osgood hash map extended, extended uh, hash map, then it's going to be fine. It's going to be hunky-dory. It's going to be... It's going to be uh, happy with it. Okay, is that enough? Is that enough for the code to work? So if I pass in an Osgood hash map, um, will will it will it allow code that's expecting a hash map to work? That's the question. What does it take to make sure that I, in creating an Osgood hash map and passing around as a subclass of hash map, don't break someone else's code that was written long before, perhaps? Ladies and gentlemen, even I was born. I know. Maybe you, maybe you think we, all we had were ones and zeros then, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, so uh, here we're going to have, uh, for example, an interface uh, adder, and I'm going to define a my adder which implements it. Okay. Um, and then I have some client which uses. Uh, uses as an adder factor, I, I create create an adder. Okay, um, so the question question is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have this way of creating an adder, and and I'm going to use an adder here. Um, so uh, let's let's consider this code. So uh, I have this. There's an adder factory. It returns an adder. Okay. Um, uh, and now I have a my adder um, that claims to be an adder, and secretly that's what's created by this factory. Um, is is that going to be okay in terms of how adder client uses it? Is it going to break adder client, for example? So we're going to talk about what it means for a type to be genuine as a subtype of another type. 
for Osgood HashMap to be a legitimate subtype of HashMap, there are certain things that need to be the case. And it has to do with this idea of substituting one for the other. If this code was written long before uh, linked hash map or Osgood hash map was written, what does it mean for this code to be safe um, uh, in terms of, of how Osgood hash map is defined? So a subtype needs to, in some sense, adhere to a certain contract with its supertype to be viewed as a legitimate subtype, a, a genuine subtype, a uh, compatible subtype. Um, and it's not just a matter of saying it's a subtype of it and simply asserting it. It involves behavior, reasoning about how it behaves, okay? And the key thing here is a compiler won't check this for you. This is one of the big reasons why object-oriented code has not led to a revolution in code quality. It's that people don't adhere to what's really needed, and it requires reasoning about behavior, okay? So the fundamental thing is, if foo is counting on certain features of HashMap, Osgood HashMap can't violate those features, can't, can't fail to <coughs> adhere to those features itself, or else the person who wrote foo will be deeply surprised and disappointed. And we're going to go through, in concrete terms, what this means and try to help you folks be able to realize when you write code, is it legitimately using polymorphism, okay? Now, we're going to be talking about it for subtyping, but we're also going to be talking about subclassing, ladies and gentlemen, with, um, which has subtyping, but also, as Kyle emphasized, code reuse. So, so let's, um, let's talk about, about uh, this feature. So here, ladies and gentlemen, we have these interfaces. These are defining contracts. Um, but not implementations. And something that's a list can be passed in as a collection. That's a subtyping relationship. Something that's a linked hash map can be passed in as a hash map. That's a subtyping relationship. But more than that, this is a subclass. Linked hash map is a subclass of hash map. What does that mean beyond just being able to pass it in as if it's a hash map? What does subclassing involve additionally beyond subtyping? Implementation. Implementation. It reuses the implementation. So, so you know, list is a subtype of collection, but collection doesn't have an implementation yet. It's an, it's an interface, and list isn't reusing an implementation. We could have a class that implements, for example, HashMap implements map. There's no reuse of implementation, but if we have some classing going on, there's a reuse of implementation. Actually, all those instance variables, all those methods get reused by linked hash map. So with subclassing, we get polymorphism. We get the ability to pass the linked hash map in as if it's a hash map, but we also have reuse of implementation. And that's going to lead to yet another level of sort of needs in terms of what it means to be safe. OK? Um, OK, so. Um, <coughs> You know, here, and one thing I've, I've been uh, emphasizing in earlier lectures, we're trying to ensure modularity. We're trying to make sure that, um, that uh, we don't have, uh, when we extend a system with a new subtype or a new subclass, we don't break everything that's already there. This is what's called the open-close principle. Um, Software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Just because I come along and I want to create an Osgoodian hash map, I shouldn't break all the code that already counts on hash maps. I, I shouldn't break that code and force it to be changed. And I shouldn't even force hash map to be redefined. The implementation of hash map should not have to change just because I want to create an Osgoodian hash map. Do you understand that principle? After all, someone might have written HashMap when you were yay tall. And you don't want to, them to have to go back and say, oh, Osgood's on the scene now. You know, now we've got to rewrite HashMap. That's, that's not how good software is written, that you know, every time it's extended, you have to go back and reinvent what's in the internals of the software. You want to minimize things. And that's the, the idea of the open-close principle. 
just because I want to extend the system shouldn't break the system as a whole. Okay, um, so we're going to be talking about um, several needs for this, um, and uh, one of the issues here is that um, we can we can have uh, subtypes that are not in fact behavioral subtypes. They're, they're fake subtypes. They're they're subtypes that are claimed to the compiler. Yes, this is a subtype of that. This is a subclass of this. But they're not used as that. They're not used in that way. Their behavior violates the contracts. And as a result, they will break code like foo that's the, depending on the apparent type but and it's passed a fraudulent subtype. So this is one of the big issues we'll be talking about. Another one, though, is that we have coupling between levels of the hierarchy, okay? Um, and, and here, for example, uh, changing a base class breaks the subclasses. Or changing a subclass causes the base class's assumptions to be violated, okay? So we're going to be talking about these. This last one is about implementation. This middle one is about, um, uh, is about the the use of, um, of subtyping, um, putting aside subclassing, which is just a, sub, a type of subtyping. It's about, it's about achieving safe subtyping, achieving safe polymorphism. The final thing which we can deal with quite, ref, uh, quite clearly is if we have code, and here will be Baz. Um, uh, I already reused Baz, okay. Now we're back to uh, Foo, okay. Um, it's on a separate board. Um, so it's a different scope. Um, okay, so here we have foo, and if foo is referring to Osgood hash maps explicitly, here's an Osgood hash map. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we might be referring to this concrete class, Osgood hash map, and we want to implement something that that is a change to Osgood hash map and start using that instead. Now this code is coupled to a particular class. And to avoid that, we will generally have code refer just to a, a, a more general type, such as a hash map. Or if possible, as Royce emphasized before, a collection, if that's all you need. Or a, a, um, or a map. And by having it refer, for example, simply to a map, then I could pass in any number of things. I could have this code could make use of Osgood hash maps, hash maps, or many other types of maps without problems. So in general, we prefer to things further up the type hierarchy, such as maps, rather than things further down to give our code generality. Okay? So this is achieved by, by referring to things further up the hierarchy. Um, but we're going to be talking about these next two problems. But first, I want to go back and reflect on a, um, a, few, a few things here, and then we'll, we'll finish up with some remarks about where we're going. OK, um, so I would like to talk about some of the trade-offs here between interfaces and classes. Turns out that interfaces um, offer some extra flexibility. Um, uh, with classes, can anyone give me here, if you're talking about subclassing, can anyone give me a constraint that's present with subclassing in a language like Java, notably not in a language like C++, but in Java, um, which is not present for interfaces? You can only extend one class. You can only extend one class. You can implement many interfaces, many interfaces, right? So there, they're more flexible. It doesn't have to be a, a hierarchy. It doesn't have to be a tree. Um, but instead, so with the, with a class-based hierarchy, you've got you know one class, and then you've got subclasses of it. And in a language like Java or a language like C Sharp, um, what you don't have is this sort of thing. What what do we call this? We have a subclass which depends on multiple superclasses. What is this called? And, and this cannot occur in Java or C Sharp, but you see it in C++, you see it in Smalltalk, and a number of other languages. What is this called? 
Anyone know? When a class has several superclasses, it's called multiple inheritance. Okay. Um, and it turns out multiple inheritance is is associated with a variety of difficulties. Um, particularly, can anyone give me a, a, a difficulty this might be associated with? Why might this cause problems? Both uh, superclasses could have implementation of the same function. Yeah, exactly. So in both of these guys, we have foo and foo. And then the question is, which foo is called? If, if, if you have a foo here, which foo is used? Or are both, if you call foo here, does it call both? Foo's on both? It's not so clear. Turns out there's a number of other issues as well. Um, but this is one of the main ones reuse of a multiple function. So in general, um, going back to, uh, uh, to Java and to C Sharp and a number of other languages that have come out, you have, you have uh, class hierarchies that are trees. You don't have, you never have an issue of multiple inheritance. Instead, you have multiple, um, uh, you can have multiple subclasses of a given class, but never does one subclass depend on two parents, okay? So classes, uh, to avoid the problems of multiple inheritance, will generally adhere in modern languages. The most common thing is to have just uh, tree-based hierarchies. Whereas interfaces, by contrast, interfaces with subtyping divorced from implementation, here you can have multiple, a given, a given class, for example, can implement multiple interfaces here. right? This is no problem at all. And, and uh, it was emphasized earlier that this allows some, for some flexibility. Um, it turns out that having this ability to, to implement multiple interfaces provides some level of reuse. After all, we can, we can have a given class that, for example, implements map and can be used in code that depends only on map, or it can implement collection and, and depend on that but it may also implement um, uh, it may implement um, serializable and pass in accordingly and as a result you can end up having kind of a, a, a mix in like style where you can have multiple features captured here it could implement uh, you know serializable and it can implement a uh, serial number um, uh, serial number supplying or what have you um, so you can get a sort of cleaner type and inheritance hierarchy. With, uh, with class-based mechanisms, it turns out that you have to be extra careful because of not only what we'll call the Liskov substitution principle that I'll be introducing shortly, but also we can get some challenges associated with subtyping, um, uh, challenges associated with capturing the functionality effectively and safely uh, so that you don't break superclasses and the superclass changes don't break subclasses. Um, but here, the key advantage that I want to emphasize, which is one that Kyle highlighted early, is it provides implementation reuse. With classes, we can reuse implementations. And we'll see why that comes with some, uh, some advantages, but also some, um, some vulnerabilities, some things you have to really watch out for. Okay. Um, so uh, in our next class, we're going to be talking about this phenomena of what it means to be a legitimate subtype. What it means for Osgood hash map to be a legitimate subtype of hash map. What it means for it to be able to be passed around as if it's a hash map safely. So it doesn't break code that was written long before it was created. That depends on features of hash map. Okay? Um, Okay, so yeah, that's um, uh, very active today. Um, so we're going to be talking about this phenomenon of, of fraudulent subtypes, in which it's easy to create a sub something that's claimed to be a subtype, but actually doesn't act that way. It doesn't it doesn't act as a legitimate subtype. Okay, um, and this is something a compiler won't help you with. It's something you have to watch out for in your code. And you need to apply some simple principles to prevent yourself from creating problems. 
if you create a subtype that's not a safe behavioral subtype, it's not a legitimate subtype, and uh, in short, if it's a fraudulent subtype, very easy to do by accident, you, your code may well be littered with bugs. So you have to be very careful about this, and this is why we're going to uh, be talking about it. Now it turns out that with subclasses, um, people reuse them for inheritance, and they get subtyping for free, and then they end up of using subtyping. So it's very common with subclassing for people to misuse it in a way which leads to bugs. And we'll, we'll see how that, that occurs, okay? Um, so subclassing is seen as a desire for code, seen to be motivated by desire for code reuse, and as a result, it breaks old code. Um, so we're gonna be introducing the Liskov substitution principle, which basically provides us a way to reason about the safety of code that uses subtypes. Um, so that's all we have time for today. Uh, on Thursday, I am going to be going over a quick introduction to Python. Uh, I'm gonna be creating it between now and then, so it's gonna be fairly brief, but it will highlight a variety of features of the language, some basics of syntax, collection <coughs> types, how you use these types, and um, some, uh, some elements of list comprehensions and other sort of um, uh, characteristics of language that are somewhat distinguishing from languages you've seen before, okay? Um, so that'll be Thursday, and I'll be announcing a, a couple day extension for the problem set to let you take that into account for finishing the problem set. Thanks very much.